In this video, you'll see how I implemented an ESP32 C3 mini module programmable through UART, suitable motor drivers which can do up to 4 amps each, and other important PCB design techniques such as voltage dividers, logic level shifting, and reverse polarity protection. Before we get started, thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. More about them later though, let's get started with the schematic. First, let's start with the power circuits within this board mainly the P-channel MOSFET, linear regulators, and motor drivers. This board is reverse polarity protected, but not with a diode as that generates a ton of heat due to the forward voltage drop, even if we were to use a shot key. So after a little bit of research online, I found this video by Afrotech Mods, which explained that I could just place a P-channel MOSFET with the drain connected to the battery input gate connected to ground, and source connected to the load for much more efficient reverse polarity protection. I won't explain how it works since you can already check out his video for that purpose, but nevertheless, I chose my P-channel MOSFET with ratings which would be safe for my system no matter which way the battery is plugged, and that meant at least plus or minus 17 volts from the gate to the source, and 9 amps continuous drain current. The SSM6J507NU from Toshiba seem to fulfill all these requirements in a 2x2mm package, so the 5 drain pins went to the battery's input, gate pin to ground, and the remaining 2 source pins to the load which comprised of 2 motor drivers and 2 LDOs. These DRV-A251A motor drivers I chose for the low pin count and package as I didn't feel like soldering fine pitch devices with my simple hot plate setup at home, and the SOIC8 was great for this. A quick read through of its data sheet determined that a pull down resistor on iProppy set the current limit, and the rest of the pins were just the motor outputs, ground, logic inputs, and a clamp for iProppy to make sure that in current sensing applications, the ADC of your system wouldn't be damaged by higher voltages than logic levels like 1.8 volts, 3.3 volts, and 5 volts. But as you'll see later, I didn't do that for some reason, and who cares about current sensing anyways? I set the current limit to about 3.8 amps with a 560 ohm resistor, which should be fine. According to my calculation, based on the formulas of 9.3.1 power dissipation and output current capability. By the way, don't face your pull down resistors like this here. Ground should always be pointing down in your schematic since it's the lower voltage potential, and it helps you distinguish between pull-ups and pull-downs. But do whatever you want, I guess. It won't affect the circuit board if you do it correctly, but there's definitely a higher chance of mistakes if you don't do it this way. As I was saying before, the second element of the load is these two linear regulators of the TLV767 series, which come in a 2x2 WSON, or very, very thin, small outline no lead package, very similar to the P-channel MOSFET used on this board. This was an absolutely terrible idea though, because if I wanted to run this board up to a four cell LiPo, which was the original goal, the amount of heat generated by essentially two variable power resistors that we know as LDOs would be insane. During testing with a two cell LiPo, this proved to be a major flaw, as the PCB got warm even under light loads and it could be felt through a couple millimeters of plastic, which probably isn't a good sign. That's because, unlike switching regulators, LDOs just dissipate all that excess voltage as heat, which is why you often see them only used to convert 5 volts to 3.3 volts in an ESP32 application like this. So that you don't make the same mistake, I would highly recommend a buck converter to step down voltage if your output voltage is any less than like 3 volts the input voltage. As ones with integrated inductors like the TPSM8290X and TPSM863253 are way smaller than standard buck converters and produce way less heat compared to an LDO as the main sources of it are from the switching of the MOSFETs and the inductor. Since my aim in designing this board was to make it as small as possible, those really inefficient LDOs powered the smallest ESP32 module, the ESP32 C3 Mini. And although there are four other mini modules in the ESP lineup with the same exact dimensions, I chose the C3 as a balance between cost, GPIOs, and performance. The good thing about these modules is that you only need about 6 external components to get them up and running, which includes 3 resistors and 3 capacitors. GPIO2 needs to be pulled up with a 10k resistor and so does GPIO8 and chip EN. 
for the chip to operate properly. And 2D coupling capacitors of values 0.1 microfarad and 10 microfarad are needed for smoothing out the supply voltage, with a 1 microfarad capacitor to ground on the chip EN line to form the RC circuit for the ESP32C3 system to boot properly. Of course, we needed a method of programming, and for this, instead of using the inbuilt USB serial JTAG of the ESP32C3 as most do, I wanted to experiment with UART because I'd never used it before this board. So I added on a 0.5mm pitch FPC with 6 pins for power, ground, receive, transmit, enable, and boot, in hopes that I could get an auto download circuit without the need for buttons and learn something along the way. You just need some 0 ohm series resistors with the RXD0 and TXD0 pins before they go to the programmer, and then you're all good. I also found this funny little arrangement here online, where if you accidentally put the RX and TX lines the wrong way around, they can easily be switched. But luckily for me, I'm an Alpha Sigma, so that didn't happen to me. By the way, another mistake I made with this board is the lack of ESD protection, so make sure to go do that on your own boards whenever there's a connector, because ESD can be seriously damaging and also just really annoying in general. Now let's talk about the various inputs and outputs that interact with the ESP32C3 Mini, and you can see here that I've used 6 of the available 10 GPIOs which would have definitely gave me room for current sensing for the motors, but who cares, right? Also, I didn't want to use the USB GPIOs, IO18 and 19 to do anything because I'm scared of ESP IDF and I wasn't sure if I could reset them to the normal GPIO states without it. Aside from that, you can see four GPIOs are occupied with the motors as PWM outputs with the in-in setup, and the other two GPIOs are connected to a logic level shifting circuit and a voltage divider respectively. Let's first talk about the logic level shifter based on SparkFun's Bob12009, which includes three components per signal, a BSS138 logic level end channel MOSFET, and two 10 kilo ohm resistors, which act as pull-ups in this application. In our case, the circuit is solely an output since it is being used to drive an RC servo, so we'll only talk about the scenarios where the low voltage side, or SPWM, drives the high voltage side, servo PWM, which is the actual output to its signal pin. When SPWM is high, the gate source voltage of the NMOS is zero volts, because both are connected to the same voltage potential, 3.3 volts. An N-channel MOSFET whose gate source voltage is below the threshold isolates the drain and the source, essentially meaning these two are separated. The 10K pull-up to 5 volts on the output side ensures that its default state is logic high. So when it's not actively being driven to ground, that's what it will remain at. Whereas when the low voltage side or the input of the logic level shifter is set to logic low or something close to 0 volts, the MOSFET's gate source voltage is 3.3 volts or logic high minus logic ground, which is above the threshold, turning the MOSFET on and pulling the output signal to ground as well. Keep in mind, this is not a boost converter, this is only possible for the 3.3 volts to go to 5 volts because I have a 5 volt linear regulator. So don't think you can go make a 3 component boost converter or something like that. Anyways, one of the last things I want to talk about is battery voltage sensing, which is extremely important if you aren't using protected cells, and especially with multi-cell LiPos, which can be quite dangerous to charge after over-discharging. For this, I used a 12-bit ADC of the ESP32C3 and a voltage divider to divide the battery's voltage by roughly 5.5, and then have it read by the microcontroller through analog read. As I was saying before, I was prepared to have the system run on a 4-cell LiPo, so I did make the voltage divider capable of handling 18.3 volts before frying the ESP chip, but this is definitely a major concern because if you plug in any more than that, the whole microcontroller will be probably done for good. During testing, I noticed that there would need to be some severe adjustments in code because of the high tolerance resistors. So I'd recommend, if you're doing this sort of thing in your own project, you get 1% or even 0.1% tolerance resistors because I think that'll make a real difference to make sure your battery is 100% okay. One thing that I was at first worried about when connecting this voltage divider up to the battery was the current flow, but this proved not to be a problem, just use high values in the hundreds of thousands of kilo ohms and you'll be fine. The higher the resistor values, the lower current consumption, so just keep that in mind with your own design. 
Just some side notes before I go, make sure you have sufficient volt capacitance on the battery's input because I found that just a 22 microfarad wasn't enough when it comes to smooth operation of the motors. And I could see from the voltage sense that the motor input voltage was dropping by half a volt in some cases when load was applied quickly. I mean these smaller capacitors to reduce smaller ripples are okay, but always make sure you've got enough farads in those bulk capacitors to make sure your voltage isn't rippling because the higher spikes of that ripple can really damage your system. You want those bulk capacitors to be low ESR like ceramics and electrolytics, but you also have to take into consideration that ceramics decrease wildly in capacitance as the applied voltage increases, which electrolytics don't. But then again, electrolytics have a much higher ESR come in space hogging packages and can be easier to damage and remove from the circuit board in SMD packages. Also, always make sure to add an on LED to your devices. And if your design is for a low power application, still do it and just add a jumper to turn it off if need be. But trust me, this will make troubleshooting so much easier. And you'll definitively be able to tell why the reason your circuit board didn't blow up was because you designed it correctly and not because power was applied incorrectly. Before we get started with the PCB design, I just want to show you how I calculated my trace widths because this was kind of hard to me to understand in the beginning and I have a little bit of an analogy to help you guys better understand this. Let's say you have a set number of runners running down a magic pipe which can magically change diameter. The larger the diameter of the pipe, the more space the runners have to run and they don't really bump into each other that much with lots of ventilation in the pipe allowing the runners to cool down and get to the finish line as quick as they can. Now let's say you decrease the diameter of that pipe so only 1.7 runners can fit side by side inside of it and their bodily heats are all combining to make the pipe really hot and stinky and maybe a couple of them get into a fight and kill themselves and maybe a couple more die because everyone forgot their deodorant that day. And because there were so many runners jumping about, let's say a hole was formed in your pipe, and some of the glass rods holding above the ground are shattered from the pipe deforming. So overall, what ends up happening is that by the finish line, you only have 60% of the runners which you did in the start of the race, since the other 40% were lost in the pipe, which is now damaged. Now replace the runners with electrical current, the runners with electrical losses, the pipe with a PCB trace, the holes with holes, and glass rods holding up the pipe with the nearby dielectric, and everything will start to make sense. Pretty simple, right? If you go to this DigiKey calculator, you can simply put in the amps that you need, put in your copper thickness, ambient temperature, and risen temperature, and you can find out the minimum width of a PCB trace to handle this current. So let's say 9 amps, 25 ambient, and 2 ounces per square foot of copper instead of the standard one ounce since I wanted heat to be dissipated better, trace length of whatever since it doesn't really matter, and a rise temperature of 25 celsius again. Then you come down here and if it's on an outside layer like the immediate top or bottom layers you click here and get that measurement and if it's an inside layer for example this is a four layer board so on layers two and three this would be the required trace width. So yeah that's basically how I made sure that I wasn't going to make a free fog machine with an integrated induction heater. And with that said, let's move on to the PCB design. So yeah, the first thing I did when designing this PCB was of course placing all the components down in a configuration where the least amount of changing between layers was needed and power plans could be made as short as possible. For example, you want to place the reverse polarity protection PMOS as close to the battery input as possible. And not like out here because that would be a nightmare to root and induce a lot more electrical losses. That's also why we have this nice rotation of the linear regulators so that most of the battery voltage connections can be made in just a couple millimeters of space. And same with the 3.3 volt supply, but not so much the 5 volt since I prioritize the battery connections over the 5 volt connections since there'd be less losses that way. Next thing I did was make the footprints for all these pads to connect the motors and battery wires using the KeyCAD footprint editor. And they're just nice rounded 2.5 by 3 millimeter SMD pads, which apparently should be able to handle the required current according to the aforementioned calculator. Only after placing all the components down, I made the board outline, since the goal was just to make it as small as possible, which means that I didn't have a predetermined set of dimensions to follow. Afterwards, I routed everything manually, keeping in mind the trace widths, 
and using an adequate amount of vias to dissipate heat from underneath chips on the ground connections. And looking back on the design, I don't think I needed these massive vias for the battery voltage and motor outputs because these small ones which have a 0.3 millimeter hole and 0.6 millimeter diameter would do just fine for up to 30 amps, but please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. As stated previously, small power planes for 3.3 volts, 5 volts, battery voltage, and some parts of the motor drivers were used for aesthetics and better thermal performance. After routing everything, I added a ground plane on all four layers which is good practice not only for heat dissipation, but also stable impedance, even though I'm not impedance matching anything for this board, and a stable zero volt reference for the digital circuits. I then connected all four ground planes of all the layers together using the VIA stitching plugin for KiCad, a part of the RF tool suite, and checked everything thoroughly before exporting the design files and ordering the boards with this channel's sponsor, PCBWay. Go to PCBWay.com and simply upload your Gerber files to the quick order page, select your parameters, and add it to the cart in just a couple clicks, and you can get 10 PCBs for as cheap as $5, with assembly starting from $30 for 20 or less PCBs. The quality of the boards that I've received, along with so many others, is amazing. And the fact that they offer CNC machining, injection molding, 3D printing, and sheet metal fabrication means that you can consider them your one-stop shop for all your robotics, electronics, and product manufacturing services. If you'd like $5 off your first order and want to help support the channel, make sure to sign up to PCBY using my link in the description. I would greatly appreciate it, and this will help me create better content for you guys in the future. Thanks so much to PCBWay for sponsoring my channel. And I hope all of you guys out there have a great night and design something awesome. Bye!